Um, okay, we'll make a start on this month's fleet seminar. Um, our PhD student is uh, Maida Musav. She is a PhD candidate at UNSW with the Centre for Advanced Solid and Liquid Based Electronics and Optics. Uh, her topic today is exploring liquid metal inf interfaces to synthesise nanostructured materials. Uh, I'll hand over to May there now and she can explain all her background and what she's going to talk about. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. I am Maide, third year PhD student at UNSW under supervision Professor Kurusha Kalan Tarzadeh. Today, um, here I'm going to talk about my PhD projects entitled Exploring Liquid Metal Interfaces to Synthesize Nanostructure Material. Before I start, I want to thank, as a part of CASLO, the Center for Advanced Solid and Liquid Based Electronics and Optics, I want to thank these amazing members who are helping me to do my PhD journey. Um, these people have proven their abilities in developing systems that have significantly influenced the areas of liquid metals, sensors, electronic materials, biomaterials, and um, medical devices. So today, before I start talking about the details of two recent publications we have done until now, I'm going to give you a short introduction about what is the liquid metal, why we are using this material, and what is the advantages of using this material for us. And then I will explain um, in details about the two uh, publications we have done um, about synthesizing nanostructure and low-dimensional material with the method based on liquid metal. Okay, um, liquid metal is an element or alloys that are liquid at um, or near room temperature. Maybe the most common name comes into your mind after hearing liquid metal is mercury, but I'm not talking about mercury because it's toxic. I'm talking about gallium and its families and its alloys because um, they have low melting point, low toxicity, low viscosity, high thermal and electrical conductivity, and many other interesting and unique properties that provide us and um, to a variety of application like next generation of electronic devices, um, sensors, catalysis, and biotechnologies. So, one of the most interesting um, uh, and unique properties of liquid metal we use in our project is the liquid-liquid interfaces as they come in contact with other solution. These interfaces are atomically ultra smooth templates that can be utilized to create nanostructure and low dimensional material. The method for use, I mean, this method based on liquid metal is fast and straightforward, and more importantly, it's cost effective and uh, eco friendly without using any toxic reagent. And uh, the morphology we got this uh, with this method, it's uh, not acceptable with other methods. So, with having this nanostructure morphology with a high surface area, it can be advantageous for different applications like gas sensing, energy storage devices, hydrogen evolution reaction, CO2 reduction, and so on. So, there are two ways to introduce precursor onto the surface of liquid metal, either by dissolving elements into the liquid metal or dissolving uh, precursor ions in the surrounding solution. So for the first scenario, I wanna give you an example um, with this publication that we have done um, with Dr. Mohanad Mayas. Um, as gallium can dissolve a wide range of elements, so it provides us opportunity to produce metal and metal oxide nanoparticle with a simple and low energy approach. So that means we are using liquid metal as a participation media um, and the precursor diffuse towards the interfaces and transform to the product. So um, we use three different electrochemical cells, gallium tin, gallium indium, and gallium zinc alloys as a, a soft electrode. And after applying polarizing voltage to this, we observe two scenarios for this material. For gallium tin, after applying polarizing um, voltage and changing, up, changing the surface tension of the liquid metal, tin came out from the liquid metal as a porous and nanostructure material. And about the zinc and uh, indium, uh, we observed 
uh, redox process. During oxidation, indium and zinc get oxidized and move to um, surface. And then during reduction, they get reduced to indium and zinc and goes into the solution. And with the electrolyte get oxidized to indium oxide and zinc oxide. So without any complex or potentially hazardous precursors, we make the metal and metal oxide nanoparticle which has a wide range of application. So as I said, the other way is uh, dissolving precursor ions in the surrounding solution of the liquid metal. In this project, we expose droplet of liquid metal to the corrosive environment, including tellurium and bismuth ions. And uh, at this pH, gallium goes to gallium hydroxide, gallium 3 plus, and because of these electrons, so um, we have a surface potential um, on gallium, on E gain, actually, in this case. And then this potential is enough for reduction of the tellurium and bismuth ions in the solution as a bismuth telluride on a surface of liquid metal. And if we give, and, uh, if we gives more time to that, it grows more, and it's very easy to exfoliate it from the surface of liquid metal. You can see these videos. As long as we're adding the precursor solution on liquid metal droplet, bismuth telluride form on a surface, and we compare it with the soli solid gallium as well. And after 10 minutes, uh, and when we remove the precursor ions and adding the DI water for washing the sample, as you see, just by um, a little bit shaking, we can exfoliate the material very easy from the surface of liquid metal, but it's not possible with the solid gallium. So um, here is another picture of that. You may ask, you may ask, is that potential enough for reduction bismuth and tellurium ions? I would say yes, because we measure the open circuit voltage um, for this system and this pH, and it shows minus 400 millivolt uh, for E gain. And then when we did the cyclic voltammetry uh, measurement for um, bismuth and tellurium ions in the solution with gold and E-gain electrode, uh, we can see it's around minus 117, minus 110 for E-gain. So minus 400 millivolt is much more enough uh, for reduction bismuth and tellurium as a bismuth telluride. And you can also see the um, reduction and oxidation peaks for these uh, metal ions. Okay, um, for the morphology, um, okay. Okay, the first, um, this picture, I mean, A, the um, figure A, it shows the back side of the material that is stick to the liquid metal. You can see it's very smooth and very flat. And the other uh, figure B shows the top side of the material of the bismuth telluride. So we did the experiment uh, at different time and different uh, temperature from one minute to 10 minutes and from 25 degree to 100 degree. And with increasing time reaction and temperature, uh, you can see growing more of the structure. And for the temperature of 175, you can also see like different morphology here, which is related to big smooth oxychloride as I will explain in um, XRD. Okay, um, we did XRD for all of these four samples, and uh, we can see the rhombohedral structure of bismuth telluride. But for the sample uh, obtained at 75 and 100, uh, you can also see the pattern for bismuth oxychloride, which is about because of the higher temperature that this oxidation happened. And it can confirm with the Raman mood as well. Um, we see um, the, of the, mood, the Raman moods of bismuth telluride, but the intensity of this mood because of the overlapping with the moods of bismuth oxychloride, uh, it's different in the sample of 75 and 100. 
Okay. Um, as you know, bismuth telluride is a topological insulator with the conductive uh, surface state. So uh, this is going to help us uh, for absorbing small molecules like gas molecules. And in this case, we use it to detect the nitrogen dioxide, which is a very toxic um, gas that is harmful for human health and environment. And detecting this kind of gas at room temperature and uh, very low concentration is very important. So we check the sensing behavior of the four samples to nitrogen dioxide. And for the sample of 75 and 100, because of those oxidation, we couldn't see any response. But for the sample happened, uh, obtained at 50 and 25, we can see response to, do, to this gas. Um, the reason that we cannot see um, any response after 80 degree for the sample of 25, it might be because of the oxidation happened. And for the sample of 50, um, there is a very thin layer of oxide on top of the material. So that's why it prevents the remain of material to get oxidized. So it's gonna help the gas sensing uh, process. So we check the sensing behavior at different temperature, different concentration, and uh, it shows very good response at 20 degree and very low concentration around one ppm. And we also check the reproduci reproducibility of the sensing by repeating um, different concentration and we get very good and stable response for that. Also for checking the effect of NO2 adsorption, uh, we check the PL intensity before and after exposing to nitrogen dioxide and raw molecules. And as you see, we have a huge quenching of PL intensity. That's because of the um, electron from interaction change after uh, transferring electron between nitrogen dioxide and bismuth telluride. And for the Raman moods, there is no shifting that normally say shifting in Raman moods related to the chemical bonding. So uh, because there is no shifting here, so maybe we can say it's, it's a physisorption. And also um, the intensity between the Raman moods um, for the first and third Raman mood chain. So uh, that's it's because of the uh, changing in electron front interaction uh, in this case. We also check the response uh, of uh, material to the gas at very low temperature, like zero and 10 degree. And um, you can see it's very, very stable response at zero. It's because of the um, in decreasing entropy and getting saturated very fast at this temperature. And here you can see checking the selectivity of uh, detecting nitrogen dioxide rather than like um, hydrogen or H2S, and there is no response for those gases, but um, we can see response for nitrogen dioxide and similar gas to nitrogen dioxide. Maybe. Okay, uh, we did more characterization for the sample, uh, showed better response to uh, nitrogen dioxide, which is a 50 degree sample. And um, as you see in XPS um, surface and depth profile uh, investigation, and there is a very thin layer, <clears throat> sorry, oxide layer on a surface, um, uh, which can protect the remain of the material for more oxidation. So that's why it shows a better response for detecting the gas. <clears throat> we also did more characterization like TM for checking the morphology of this sample. And as you see, there is a little bit porosity in this sample. Uh, so we did N2 um, adsorption, desorption, and uh, from the shape of this um, BET analysis, we can say that we have the plate-like structure and a slide-like pores, and um, the surface area we got, it's around 28 um, square meter, um, I think, yeah. And uh, from the BJH um, analysis, we can see the size distribution of the forest. It's around two to five nanometer. And we did it with the software as well and um, checking the images and we get the same result. For the next project, we use this interfacial phenomena 
um, again, for electrochemically deposit tin dope tellurium on a surface of liquid metal and um, make the rigid and flexible substrate as a, a pseudo capacitor electrode. So why we go for this project? Because as you know, supercapacitors are characterized by having high power density, um, long stability and um, fast charge discharge process, but they still suffer from having low energy density. So researchers are, are trying and focus on making new electrodes to get higher um, energy density. And um, for in this case, um, pseudo capacitors and hybrid capacitive behavior, uh, pseudo capacitors, I mean, uh, the Faradic charge transfer and um, hybrid capacitive behavior, the combination between the double layer um, charge transfer and Faradic charge transfer, uh, gonna offer higher energy density. So what we did in here, uh, we painting um, liquid metal on a silicon gold coated electrode and a dip into the precursor solution, including tellurium and tin and uh, deposit the material electrochemically uh, for uh, and having this electrode. Uh, you may ask why tellurium, why tin? Because as you know, tellurium is a well-known semi-metal. And when we combine it and allow it with other uh, post-transition metal like tin, uh, it's gonna increase the conductivity and electrochemical um, properties, um, which is a very good and make it very good candidate for uh, supercapacitor and um, energy storage devices. So um, the procedure is the same. And um, here again, um, we measure the, um, the surface potential of liquid metal at this pH to see if it's enough for reduction of tellurium and uh, tin or not. And uh, we get the same um, result, which is, enough for that. And um, we also check the, um, the CV measurement for just tellurium, just tin and tin dope tellurium. And we can see the reduction peak for tellurium and tin in the system of tin dope tellurium. And the oxidation peak, as you see the intensity change, uh, that's because of the overlapping of oxidation tin and tellurium. So we have both in our system. And in this case, um, uh, I should explain that we use very low concentration of the precursor solution because um, liquid metal here has two roles. One is using liquid metal interfaces to um, depositing the material and make the material. And the other thing using liquid metal as a current collector. And this intimate contact between the active material, I mean, tin of tellurium and liquid metal is very important because it prevents the ohmic losses during the charge transferring and storing energy into the material. So we use very low concentration and uh, we check different concentration to see which one is better. And <clears throat> for, for example, um, the precursor ions uh, concentration of 0.5 millimolar, 0 0.25, 0 0.125. Um, these are gives us the same structure, but at different times. So I try different time and I got, for example, for 0.5, we need just 10 minutes to have a connected and very nice structure. But for 0.25, we need 30 minutes, the other one 60 minutes. So we use the 0.5 millimolar concentration and we did the experiment um, for 10 minutes reaction time. Because if, it's, um, if we use higher concentration and it gives more time, it's gonna peel off from the a liquid metal as I showed you before. So we did more characterization. When I say tin dope tellurium, the reason is here because we did the XRD measurement and we can see the hexagonal crystal structure of tellurium. And because the amount of tin is very low and um, the radius of tin and tellurium is quite similar. So um, we cannot see uh, anything from tin in here, but, <clears throat> and for Raman mood, the intensity change but there is no like obvious changing. Uh, but if we look into the XPS or uh, TEM, um, EDS mapping, um, 
we can see the existence of tin inside the material. Mm. Uh, and also the thickness of the material, if I want to mention it, we did AFM and we also um, cut the sample, a sample with a um, FIP technique for um, TEM, for doing TEM. And as you see, the thickness of the sample, it's around 25 to 30 nanometer that we got the same from AFM as well. And yeah, that's the old characterization we did. So for checking the electrochemical behavior and performance um, of our sample, we try different electrolyte, like ionic um, liquid, acidic and basic solution, and non-aqueous solution. Um, but in acidic and basic solution, after um, long cycling, uh, the material start coming off from the electrode. So, um, but, and for example, for ionic liquid, we don't have uh, like very good paradigm efficiency. Um, so we use um, sodium sulfate, one molar sodium sulfate, the pH is around seven, and uh, we get very good results and performance from that. Um, at all of the scan rates, tellurium uh, shows lower capacitance than tindo tellurium. Um, in figure C, you can see the difference between the capacitance for tellurium and tindo tellurium. And also um, for the charge and discharge events, which is asymmetric, and uh, it seems that it shows that we have a Faraday charge transfer in this case, and also from the Nyquist plot, uh, the vertical line close to 90 degree, and um, it shows that we have very good capacitive behavior of the electrode and the changing phase is, is around minus uh, 80 degree, which is very good. So we did different these techniques to evaluate the um, charge capacitance of the film, like CV, EIS, GCD, and so on. But it's also very important to make and design the material for the flexible energy storage, um, energy storage device. Um, it's very important because um, it's used for variable and portable electronic devices, which has a wide application in transport, transportation, health and industrial monitoring and environmental application. Um, but for two electrode system in here, um, First of all, I want to explain how we make it. We use the uh, polypropylene sheet. We uh, coated very with the very thin layer of gold and then um, painting um, liquid metal on top and then dip into the solution and make this uh, two electrode uh, system. The potential that's working our material in this case is higher uh, range um, rather than three electrode system. And we can see higher power and energy density for our system rather than other um, literature. And um, we also check the mechanical stability with bending um, our material at different angles and we get very good retention around 95%. Uh, so as a conclusion, we use the autogenous surface potential of liquid metal for making highly crystalline bismuth telluride and um, which shows a very good response to uh, NO2 detecting and also for uh, making tin, um, tin film, tin doped tellurium um, with a good um, stability, mechanical stability and higher power and energy density for the, uh, for the application we use. And now um, we are trying to make another combination of, for example, tellurium with other metals um, and checking the application for those two as well. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. But before I start uh, answering the question you may have, I wanna say these days we are uh, we Iranian um, not feeling well because of the situation uh, happening in Iran and um, as you, uh, I, I'm not sure you heard the news or not, but um, two or three days ago um, at one of the best universities in Iran, Sharif University, 
um, many students arrested and uh, tortured by a government and regime just because they are protesting for their rights and for the freedom. So I just want to ask uh, you to be their voice and uh, support these students um, because it's totally unfair if as a student uh, to be in a jail and they are the most intelligent students that they are studying now in Harvard or Berkeley universities, the, the most prestigious universities in the world get them a scholarship. They are so smart, they are so intelligent, but now they are in a jail just because of the protesting. So we as students are not feeling well, we Iranian are not feeling well these days, and I hope that you can be their voice. Thank you so much. Okay, if anyone's got questions for me, just unmute yourself and, and ask away. Pardon? Sorry, mate, I was just saying if anyone has a question, they can just unmute themselves and, and ask the question. Yeah. Muted? Should I mute it? Um, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is that? Are they in the audience, Maida? If they got yes, and, and, if, and uh, have you got a microphone that they can have? So, um, is that or you just repeat the question? Yeah. So the question is, um, aside from uh, nitrogen sensing, yeah, are you also looking into sensing other gas um, using the same concept that you just explained? Um, you mean checking the selectivity to nitrogen dioxide? Um, I check with the hydrogen and uh, H2S as well, and I didn't get any response for those gases. The only response we, we observed was with the NO2. I didn't check other gases like NO2, similar to NO2, because, you know, whatever we had, I did the experiments in the lab. So um, I think um, these material are going to have response to NO2 or any similar gases like NO2. Yeah. Oh. Then can I have a follow up question? Yeah. Um, if you maybe like find another um, liquid metal that could sense or detect gases uh, aside from nitrogen oxide, would you be able to develop more on that? Sorry, I didn't get your question. What? Uh, sorry, like <laughs> if you have a different liquid metal, um, formulation mm -hmm. that you think might um, detect other gases beside nitrogen oxide. Okay, maybe I should correct you first because the material we use for uh, detecting gas is a bismuth telluride. So how we get this bismuth telluride? Using the liquid metal based. Um, I mean, I use the liquid metal for making this material and then collect this material so the one is doing the detecting is bismuth telluride, not the liquid metal. So um, if you ask other liquid metal can make this, I would say um, yes. Yeah. Gallium-based liquid metal, maybe it's better to say gallium-based liquid metal. If you expose it to the corrosive environment, basic or acidic, and including some ions, gonna give you this reduction reaction. No worries. Any questions from online? Might be an early early finish, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um. If there isn't any more questions, then we will th I'd like to thank Maida for her presentation. Um, and we will meet again in another, oh, actually we will meet again for a fleet seminar in another month, but there'll be a, a colloquium coming up before then sometime at the end of this month. So we'll catch up with everyone then, but thank you very much Maida for the presentation. Even I, as a non-physicist, got a little bit out of that and understood it and thought it was interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you. See ya.
Bye, everyone.